Nick, thank you so much for joining us today on the Athletics of Business podcast. I am extremely fired up to have you here with us. Yeah, thank you. I'm grateful to be here, Ed. This is uh, a lot of fun. Excited to have a chance to finally uh, be on your show with you. Well, well, I tell you what, we've been blessed with some great guests, and, and we're going to jump right into it. And I'm going to, I prefaced it a little bit in the introduction, but give the listeners some context here. We're right in the middle of the COVID-19, the coronavirus, uh, the global pandemic. Um, you have an amazing journey. Um, you know, we tell you and I have had some wonderful conversations prior to recording this podcast and everything comes back to trust, right? Everything comes back to trust. And I'd love for you to take us a little bit on your journey here up to now and, and what trust has meant to you. We'll talk about trust and track and, and where you're introduced to that and all the amazing things that you've built to help you at this time, not just to, to you know, to grow through this, not just to go through this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Happy to do that. And I, I agree with you 100%. Um, trust is really important. The challenge is that it's a big word and means a lot of different things to different people. Um, and, you know, I dissected it and paid attention to the word and love Stephen Covey's book, The Speed of Trust, and mm -hmm. separating out like character trust from competency trust has been helpful for me as well. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an important part. And I'll be, uh, I'm sure as we talk through this, um, that topic's going to come up. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your journey, because it's really, it's pretty amazing when you sit back and look at it. I don't know if it's so amazing. Uh, I mean, it's pretty average, actually. And maybe that's what's funny about it. Um, yeah, you know, I grew up in, in the city, uh, mostly on the north side. You know, people ask, what neighborhood were you in? You know, we actually moved, moved around quite a bit because my dad was... Uh, I'm guilty as charged, by the way, because I... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, my I, I was fortunate because I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family. My dad um, were very traditional Italian. He had five brothers, you know, my grandma raised, you know, my grandma raised all five boys on her own in, you know, in Chicago and uh, mostly around the Cicero area, around Cicero. Um, but we moved, my dad, my dad had really a couple businesses all the time. Um, he was actually in aluminum siding and remodeling business back in the day, right? The Tin Man kind of days. Right, right. So we had that remodeling thing going on, but we always had a restaurant too. Um, and it's funny because I, you know, definitely seasonal construction stuff. So more in, more in restaurants in the winter than the summer. Uh, but because of that, every time we bought a house, my dad would remodel it and fix things up and then we'd move. So we were but mostly around the north side of the city growing up. Um, but I would say the, back to my story, I think a big part of who I am, I didn't realize at the time, but I learned a lot. Uh, uh, I, the term entrepreneur didn't even, you know, I didn't even know, it, you know, that was never spoken to, right. but just lived, you know. And I would say a big part of that was, you know, I learned, I think some key things that I learned from my dad was really like every time we just driving down the street with him as a kid, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old, I had to work with him all the time. I had no choice, but you know, <laughs> he, he would always, you know, he, he would point out a business or we'd go to one of his buddies' businesses and always asking the question, why are they doing it that way? Is that really the best way you could do it? How can we do it better? You know? Oh, you know what? That's a tire store. I bet that could be a better, like, dress shop or, you know, they should open the McDonald's over here. And, you know, so that kind of questioning day to day uh, just developed a mindset for me about how to question things and do things differently. And, and because, you know, he, didn't, he only had in up to an eighth grade education mm -hmm. um, and really did well for himself. But he, you know, I think always not getting stuck in what, um, you know, any kind of corporate or any philosophy about the way everybody says it's got to be done this way. Mm -hmm. um, my dad always said, you know, if you want to get ahead of life, you got to do something different than the average guy does, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I was always, you know, from business to sports, you know, that was, that was always in my mind. And I think, you know, those are two, a couple of things that really shaped my philosophy was, you know, growing up with my dad and an entrepreneur, mindset um i think my little italian grandma and sister all grown, she taught, taught me a lot of, of great values and i think the other thing was um you know my dad either to kept up keep us off the streets i either had to be working with him or in sports and i learned a lot from football and wrestling 
Mm. Um, I would say, you know, especially as a coach in wrestling, I told the kids, you know, the self-discipline, some of the things I learned about wrestling have really helped me as an entrepreneur. Mm. Oh, and, and wrestlers are known to be a little nuts and so are entrepreneurs. So it really goes hand in hand. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I think <laughs> taking risk, you know, what the heck, going for it, you know? Well, a ton of, a ton of self-discipline. I mean, it, the work ethic is off the hook. So, so take us through your, your journey with your career, all the different industries that you've been in and, and, and where you're at now. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it's funny because uh, after working at my dad's restaurants, I actually thought I was so burned out by the time I was done with high school with, you know, not having Friday nights and Saturday nights with my friends and stuff. I was like, Dad, I'm never going to get in the restaurant business again, you know. And uh, because of that, I wanted to. I liked to work with my hands. I became a carpenter. Started at McCormick Place, actually. Um, and that was a little boring. So then I went into <laughs> residential stuff, and loved building houses. Really did. I mean, I felt I was like, okay, this is. I was so passionate about it. Loved, you know, the whole. And my brother actually went to school for architecture. So sure enough. A few years later, after I'm, I start doing side jobs and my brother graduates from college with a degree in architecture, we started our own doing a spec house. One spec house yeah. led to two. Yeah. Next thing you know, we got our own construction company. Wow. Um, so, so that worked out well for, and actually still is working out well. My brother still has a construction company. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, my journey, uh, what happened was I got married and had three kids, you know, and then we ended up moving out to the Burbs and yep. I wanted my kids to go to good schools. Moved, moved actually, uh, we we're building houses out in that Crystal Lake area in mm -hmm. Cary and stuff. And, uh, Great area. I bought, yeah, it's the Northwest suburbs of Chicago, for those of you who don't know. And uh, my kids were little, taking them out to eat. You know, my Danny was, you know, they were like two, four, and six, Danny, mm -hmm. Nick, and Michelle. And uh, I, I just realized that there wasn't a place where you could take the family to go out to eat that was like a fun place for the whole family. Mm. You go to the cheesy place that was great for the kids, right. but the food truck, you know. Right. Yeah, brutal for to, the adults, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you go to a better place for the adults, and the, the servers didn't treat the kids like first right. class. You know, they would treat, they would be right. good to the adults, but the kids were like a pain in their butt. And right. my angel, right? You know, I couldn't right. imagine that. <laughs> really probably probably the reason you're out to eat in the first place too yeah exactly yeah so uh i i at that time too i was also starting you know about 11 years into the construction business it was changing it wasn't about quality craftsmanship anymore there was now there was nail guns you know it was about building a house fast right uh it wasn't as fun for me and i'm a big fan of passion i i just think i believe in you know we should be doing what we love every day. If not, it's time to look for something else. And so I was sitting with the timing of losing my passion in the construction industry and seeing this as an opportunity, even though it was a gazillion restaurants at the time, pizza right. places at the time, I thought, you know what, I'll take my dad's recipe and I'm going to build my own place. And I think we could do it better. And, uh, so I gave it a shot. I didn't have much money, but, uh, <laughs> I had to, I had a, you know, I actually wanted to build like an old, my design was this old, like uh, Midwestern barn look. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And it worked out good because I didn't have any capital. So I went and knocked on farmers doors and asked them, <laughs> look for the farm that was like the barn that That's was awesome. falling down and yeah. said, Hey, can I, you know, I'll take this off your hands. The yeah. guy's like, look at me sideways. Oh yeah, yeah. sure. Take it. You know? Yeah. Uh, and but that was before old barnwood was cool, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is 1995. Well, you made it cool, Nick. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah right, right. I'm a tr such a trendsetter. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to say. Uh, anyhow, uh, so I, I was able to design and build my first restaurant myself in 95 in, in the Crystal Lake area, you know, northwest suburbs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and luckily, I opened the doors and the place was packed from day one. Yeah, at, awesome. You know, and I, after so many people telling me, I had you probably experienced this too, you know, I, and when I started the plans and started building it, I had so many people telling me I was going to fail. Oh, yeah. The location wasn't on the main strip, you know, mm -hmm. restaurants are so hard. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, all that did was fuel me up. Yeah. All that did was fire me up to say, yep. yeah, right. You're going to tell me I can't do something, you know, mm -hmm. right. And then you so, know what the best part about those people are is those are the same ones that say, but let me know if I can do anything to help you. Yeah. That's just the person I want help from. Someone <laughs> right. me I'm going to fail. Okay. Yeah. Plus I use your ideas. <laughs> right. 
So anyhow, I was so, so happy when I opened the doors and it was packed. You know, I mean, I wanted to hug every guest. Yeah. Um, and it really was, I think the community was really looking for that place to come with their family, with the neighbors and their big restaurants. At that time, they were just under 200 seats. They're half the size, you know, they are now in 2000. I put an addition on okay. it made it um, a 350 seat restaurant, about 9,000 square feet. Uh, so they're massive, full service, you know, pizza, casual dining restaurants. Uh, and uh, really, I mean, about a year into it, after I was able to stop working 20 hours a day, you know, and start, start getting my act together and realizing <laughs> I really need to train other people so I don't right. have to do everything. Right. Um, I had this epiphany, Ed, about, you know, how do I build, you know, I really want to, I think part of it was people coming to me and asking for raises and I'm like, I don't want to be that kind of manager boss where people come to me for permission all the time. I had some bad experiences with previous bosses myself. And so I thought, you know, right around then I was like, how do I create a company where people enjoy coming to work every day? Um, and I had long been since my high school days, I had always been, interested in psychology and human behavior and why people perform and uh, at their bat, you know, and I was very competitive myself too. So I was always like interested in how do I have people like do their best here at work, but do it because they enjoy it themselves, mm. not because I'm telling them to do it, you know? So right. I really started to, that's where I started reading and researching, like how do I build a place that has meaning? Um, and that, that, I think inquiry really brought me down a path to, I, you know, I started reading about companies like, for me, the only ones that were doing that had that kind of mindset in business. Mm -hmm. I started reading about Whole Foods back then. I started reading the, you know, Starbucks was, you know, newer back then, mm -hmm. you know, right. Re read Howard Schultz's first book. Um, you know, so I was you know, like trying to figure this out. And then I met a consultant, this guy, Rudy Mick, um, because I wanted to, it was right around 2000 or so that I wanted to grow my business. Um, I read, I met this guy, Rudy Mick, and he was the one who helped us define our purpose and our values. Yeah. Um, that was a game changer. You know, let's, he, let's talk I about met him. Yeah. Let's talk yeah. Yeah. When I met him, he, you know, I had been looking for a bunch of consultants and most of the consultants were like, here's how you make more money. Here's how you put security cameras. <laughs> and, and back to that trust thing. Right. I'm like, that's BS. You know, I, I think all security cameras create is an environment of less trust. You're mm -hmm. sending a message, you know, but, and I actually had no problem making money. I was making tons of money. That wasn't the issue for me. It was about how do I expand my business and still hold on to what I had created around trust, around care for our team. We cared about each other and create meaning at work. And I, I didn't have the right language for it. It was just an in, intuition until I met Rudy. And that's where he was like, Nick, you have all this passion inside you. Mm. Let's take that passion from inside you, inside your gut, right? Mm. And define your a collective purpose for the organization and collective values. I was like, that sounds really cool. I have no idea what the hell you're talking about, but that sounds really <laughs> cool. <laughs> it had to be somewhat of a relief too, to know that you had it in you. Now let's just figure it out. Yeah. Well, uh, we did, you know, we did a offsite with uh, about a dozen of our team members. We had, I had 60 employees at the time, so we were fairly small. Um, but after those workshops of defining our purpose and our values, I, that was, I still say that was a transformational point in my life game changers my so many things in my life changed after that i was like holy cow this is amazing <laughs> and I've, I, yeah and i've heard you say purpose is why we do what we do right yes, and, and yeah. it's back to the simon center but it's why we do what we do it's why we get up every day you know a lot of people in the entrepreneur world talk about in business in general talk about what keeps them up at night i prefer to look at what gets me up in the morning but what you know how did that parlay into and lead into figuring out a way to build the business so people love being there? Well, uh, to be, you know, 100% transparent with you is um, at the time, I had no idea and no care about what anybody else was doing in, in business. 
you know, I just cared about being the best. I, you know, I was very competitive. It's like, uh, I don't, you know, I wanted to be the best, uh, I wanted to be the best kind of place for people to work, come work. And of course, I wanted to be the best restaurant in the area. You know, I wanted people to love coming to us. Um, and when I did this purpose and value stuff, I was like, wow, this is, I've been searching yeah. for a way to create meaning and fulfillment in people's lives. And this is the key. So, and Rudy even says to this day, he says he's never had a client that actually took his work to the 10th level the way I did, you know? Um, so we created, I started to create systems. Again, I think that carpenter mindset about how do I, I started creating systems around purpose and values. So even though it's not a tangible concept, I started, you know, we have a process around if we have an issue or a problem, we go instead of issue solution, which or issue manager solution, right? Yeah, yeah, there it's, you go. We, we have a, a chart on the wall that's, you know, in the break room, you know, in the office, it's issue purpose and values solution, right? It's such a simple concept, but really before any, any one of us, any one of our team members, managers, anybody could solve a problem themselves. They can take care. They don't have to go run into a boss. Here, in orientation, we're going to teach, we're going to talk about our purpose and values, teach you what that means, and we're also going to give you this tool, issue purpose value solution, so you can solve problems on your own without having to go ask for permission. Mm -hmm. you know? So little tools like that, you know, we kept, I, again, I wanted to build a system around things so we could be the best, and I wasn't, I didn't, nobody had to come to me for permission, right? Flatter organization, led by the team, um, by the team, by the team, and and I mean like 16, 17, 18 year olds, you know. And That's it, what's truly remarkable when you think about it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it is it is a diverse group. Um, you know, now we have two restaurants. Mm -hmm. You know, with the systems in place, we went ahead and opened the second restaurant in Elgin in 2005. Uh, that one I built, you know, to the full 350 seat restaurant. Just replicated it. Uh, all, uh, opened the doors with great success, had great sales. I mean, you know, now, you know, that brought us up to about 200 team members, um, really pretty diverse. I mean, there's, of course, there's older folks, you know, servers, bartenders in their fifties and single moms and, you know, Latino, yeah. you know, all very diverse, you know, but a lot, I would say 70% of our 200 team members were under the age of 25. Um, Why well, I can speak from experience. Obviously, our kids love the place. My family loves the place. The, our friends love the place. But what's really cool about it is you go in there and you feel like you're home, you know, and not just because of the fireplace, but in the ambiance, but because of the way people treat you. Right. And I've never had so much fun waiting for a table in my entire life for such great conversations with the folks that that work at, a, at an establishment. So, I mean, it, it works and it works in, in good times and it works in bad times. And I'd love to, to kind of go back and, and talk about um, the culture you built and how that helped you at a very significant tipping point in 2011. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good point. I, lo I love what you said about even. You know, the final point I just want to make, you know, just off of what you said, like even waiting for a table. Um, when when an organization really wants to live their purpose and values, they're going to put it into every part of the business, right? So hiring, orientation in our training. So when we start building the training out, for example, for the host team, you know, we have four or five hosts uh, that run the restaurant basically, but, you know, so what we said with the host and what we de designed is like, so how do we incorporate our purpose in the host training? So as an example, Ed, you know, we don't, we don't give people waiting for a table, a beeper or a monitor and treat people like a number. You know, we treat them like humans. So we give one of the hosts, the host that fills the restaurant, a microphone, and we say improv and have fun on the microphone when you right. call guests up, you know, right. and, so, so that's just another way right. of having the purpose and values come to life. Absolutely. So, so I think, you know, back, you know, I, what I found is, you know, like I said, I did this, you know, for really because I, I cared about the team and, you know, and I, I went on in 2004 or five, I went to 
Uh, I read the book, The Great Game of Business by Jack Stack. Went to those conferences, the mm-hmm. great, great Game of Business conferences, because I had already been doing open books. And um, I didn't, you know, I, not very well, but I was doing, I was sharing our financials. <laughs> and, that, and then this, this gave me a framework so I could systematize, like I love doing, you know, systematize a scalable way to have open books. Um, so all these things are trust building, culture building processes. And to me, you know, what I've learned about culture, culture is, I mean, there's a bunch of different definitions, but what my definition of culture is, is stop frame any organization, any group, right? For, you know, a minute or five minutes and watch their behaviors. Their behaviors are the culture. And it might not necessarily be the plaque on the wall that we want it to be, you know? It is what it is. You know, I think we're, with the opportunity where purpose and values provides is being intentional about the culture we want to create. Right. Most companies, right, right, culture um, is dependent on the loudest voice in the room, which mm-hmm. could be a high performer or it could be the negative nanny, right? Which mm-hmm. drama and, you know, culture just happens. Instead with purpose and values, we are, we define our culture, we're explicit about it, and then it creates you know, what we intended. Um, that made a big difference for me as we got into the tough times of the recession. Well, and what I, what I love about that is it's not command and control with you, right? I mean, you're building a culture, intentionally building a culture where you're getting the feedback from everybody involved in the decision making. And it's just the empowerment that that provides and the ownership. You know, I just had a, a, today's podcast um, that goes out Jason Bay talks about owning your dirt, you know, and it's yeah. the collective ownership, right? And you talk about that, like we own our purpose and values and we, we own our mission. And, and obviously that's talking about the future, which, which I love as well that you talk about, but what's that sense of with, with the younger folks that you have working for the sense that they're valued, that the work they're doing is important and that they're really a part of everything that's happening. Yeah. I, it drives me nuts when uh, you hear people talk about millennials or the younger generation and how, you know, all the things they, you know, generalize and say they, they're entitled and they don't, you know, I have such a different experience of them. Um, this generation is really high performers. Mm-hmm. Um, the challenge with I see, you know, in, again, from my experience of the team we hired and why they're high performers, you know, what I've seen is, is they want to be about something bigger. So purpose, you know, when we connect with purpose, it's important to them. When we connect with value, it's important. You know, um, the other the other challenge I think, which was harder for the older generation, is this generation has a higher expectation of managers, mm-hmm. of leaders. Mm-hmm. They expect that if you say these are our values. They, they're expecting those, this leadership to live those values. And if you're not, they're going to like flip you off and say, I'm out of here. And, you know, or <laughs> literally. Like, yeah. literally. Right. Uh, so, so I think that's awesome. We have, they have a higher expectation of leadership. That's not a bad thing. And then, and the other thing is that, that, you know, of course they don't have a lot of trust in leaders anymore because look at the models we have this day and age. We right? set this not, up. Yeah. Yeah. Not real mm-hmm. good. No. And I think the other thing is uh, empowerment with open books and training. You know, we have a system where the team gets their own raises. They could see their career path is transparent. We, you know, it's actually, um, we actually have it, you know, in the break rooms and stuff, we have a chart of how to get raises and how you, you know, what your career path could look like. Super transparent. Right. Everybody knows what everybody else is making because they have a rookie pro expert, like hat system, mm-hmm. you know, love it. Cars. Yeah. How'd you come up with that? Uh, well, yeah, that was another one of those, um, you know, people come to me for a raise. I, that was like a pain in my butt. I didn't really like that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, this is I, this is probably about a year, two years, three years in, um, where I actually started asking the team, you know, hey, you know what I think, you know, how could you get your own raises? Let's start figuring out a way that, you know that we could create a system for people to get their own raise. And I thought if, 
if I train people well and I shared how we make profit, why not? You know, so I started with a, a certification program where, you know, somebody, um, they started in an entry level, say as a pizza maker or at a host, whoever it was, but um, they start out there and we get them certified at what they were hired for. We call that the 201 level mm -hmm. after they go through orientation. Mm -hmm. Once they're certified, now they're a rookie mm -hmm. and in the organization we give them in the heart of house we give them a tan hat they're a rookie and then as they get three more certifications now they become a pro in the heart of house or at the host desk and uh, and then they get a red hat you know to signify they're a pro so everybody could see that they've moved up right and then uh they get all the certifications they're a black hat expert Right, they get another like buck and a half raise to get to that level. Yeah. Now they're not only are they no more valuable themselves, but they've created more value for our organization because they can, they could do so many things right. in the heart of the house, the kitchen we call the heart right. of the house. Yep, love that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like back up for one second to the orientation. Forgive me because I should have said this before. I love it because one on one and two on. Let's talk about what those are and the fact that aren't those like the third step of the orientation? Like you don't actually get to the food part of the orientation until you've talked about a few other things that are most important to you. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, yeah, our, well, again, internally, you know, our purpose. So by the way, our purpose is our dedicated family provides this community an unforgettable place to connect with your family and friends to have fun in the field at home. So we put that, and the values as a cover sheet of the application. Mm -hmm. So we're starting off with that message. Someone comes and asks for a job. And when we hand them an application, our host hand them an application, they ask them to please read that. And then after they read it, if that feels like something we want to be a part of, go ahead and fill out the application. If not, that's okay. Just give us the application back. You know, go somewhere else. Have you actually had people hand the application back? Because that would blow me yeah, away. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, there's I mean, I can probably about 10%. Okay. Uh, you know, kids are like, eh, mom told me I have a job. I don't know about all this. You know, they're like, okay, yeah. no, thank you. No, it's okay. But <laughs> again, we're setting the expectation. Yeah. Right. Yep. And then once, once people get through, uh, we have a pretty disciplined, rigorous hiring process, two interviews, experiential. Um, once they get through that, then everybody goes to orientation. I don't care if you're a bookkeeper, marketing, pizza maker, bartender, uh, everybody's going through the orientation. And we do, you know, in the orientation, we're going to talk about our purpose and our values, issue, purpose, value, solution, these processes. It's all about culture. Our orientation is uh, probably about 10 hours long. And, you know, we're doing, we're not asking people if they like our purpose and values, we're doing exercises. Mm -hmm. around how do the how would the values show up in these experiences how does the values show up in your life you know like what so so it's very experiential interactive um you know and then we go through uh, uh you know at nix everybody's again this younger generation likes about the organization is it's pretty um what's the word but they're you know it's it's based on your own ability it's to uh, to be able to perform and move up the ladder, it's not mm. it's 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 meritocracy, right? It's, right. It's performance based mm. versus permission based. Uh, so that we go through that in orientation. So all that stuff is about the culture before you actually learn anything about what you were hired for. I mean, the job that you were hired for. To do. So after orientation, then we do a brief like four or five hour one on one where we'll go in the heart of the house and everybody, everybody makes our product. Mm -hmm. So again, purpose is why we do what we do. Values are how we do what we do. Neither one of those are what we do. Mm -hmm. And now we go to our product, our what, our what is very important. It's just different, you know? So everybody makes a pizza, they make a beef sandwich, they make, you know, some salads or whatever, uh, might be, you know, 90, 100 degrees in there, that's okay. Um, they get to feel that. And then uh, after 101, then they get to break off and do what they're hired for. They go to their 201 training. And uh, that's what I just talked about earlier, the 201 level. Now, if they want to be a trainer at Nix or 
a manager at Nix or open their own business, they can go to 301 level. And the 301 level is where we teach emotional intelligence skills. Um, that 301 level was our train the trainer program. You know, what has now turned into the trust and track business in itself. So it, it evolved into the trust and track leadership program. And then we had so many other businesses that what were interested in what we were doing. Mm. I opened that program up to the public. So basically our train the trainer program became its own business called yeah. the trust and track Institute. Let's um, talk, let's talk about that. What trust and track is. So that term got developed actually when Bo Burlingham, who wrote, uh, was writer for Inc magazine, Inc the business magazine. Yes. Uh, yeah. He, and he also wrote the book, small giants, amazing guy. You know, yep. Yeah. Really great guy. He knows a lot about business. He was doing a story about us for Inc magazine and, uh, he was the one who was like, Nick, the, your leadership style that you're doing and your managers are doing is unique. It's similar to other leaders in small giants businesses that I've studied. He said, but it's, it's definitely to your point, like you said, Ed, he goes, this is not command and control, <laughs> you know, right. something different, you know, and that, you know, that conversation and uh, led to this definition of it wasn't trust and hope. It wasn't trust and verify. It was really trust and track because we start from a place of believing in people. We want to believe, we do, I do believe people want to do their best in the morning when they start the day, right? right. I, I believe 90% of people have good intentions. Uh, so we're going to start from a place of trust. Then we're also going to track their behaviors and give feedback along the way of how they're doing, celebrate those positives or course correct, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's those two parts, trust and track performance. Right, right. Now, talk about the success of that and, and how that, kind of evolved? Uh, yeah, so the, it really evolved first, you know, in, in a really successful model for our leadership team, because it is mostly around developing emotional intelligence skills, mm -hmm. especially in customer service industries. Mm -hmm. Although we've helped industries all over the world. We've helped businesses all over the world. They've come to our class. Now I go out and do, uh, I go out to other businesses and help other corporations. I, I'm helping a company in California in the aviation. They have, you know, a thousand employees. Well, they had a thousand employees pre COVID. Mm -hmm. um, right. But, you know, so we're, so that's how, that's, that's what's really evolved. I think the most important thing is that it's, um, it's a foundation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to our leadership style and has helped us through. I mean, talk about the crisis we're in now. It's also that training and, and this culture stuff has helped us through the recession. Um, you, know, if, you know, I wrote a book about it and all that stuff, but really it's, it's, it's a great model, I think, for the 21st century and for sure for this generation. Um, I, it just happened. I, you know, I just started it because I thought it was the right thing to do and the right, right. way to treat people, as my grandma would tell me, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. Um, and it's turned out to be really effective this day and age. I love how you go back to the lessons you learned from, from your Italian grandma. I love that. From our first conversation. I, I love it. Yeah. I got to tell you, one of the things that was really was weird to me back in the you know, early days of my business, when other, like the local community college came to me and said, what are you doing here? You know, you have such low turnover, less than 25% turnover. In our, you know, I had people coming to my business and asking questions. The Chicago Tribune did a story, you know. And I, and I was like, what do you mean I'm doing something different? I go, didn't everybody have a grandma Teresa the way I did and teach you this is the way you're supposed to treat people? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? It's just a way of life. That's all I know. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Well, let's talk about your book. I absolutely love the title, A Slice of Pie, How to, is it how to Run a Big Little Business. Let's talk about yeah. the book, what it was like to write that book and how some great stories came out and what, what's inside of that book. Yeah, so it is uh, just... Yeah, I wrote the book from the perspective of an operator. Um, I love reading books and I, you know, I, and then they've been very helpful for me, but what it was different, what I wanted to achieve is I didn't want to be a consultant or an academic talking about the way things should be in theory. It's, you know, as a small business owner, I was searching for a more of a how to from an operator's perspective. Uh, so that's really was my intention in writing the book is I'm, you know, I wanted to, I shared anecdotes and how 
what I talk about the systems that we built, you know, through the stories of the team, you know, and how this works and how it doesn't work and, you know, where we've had problems and how I had to fix and alter and change things as I went. Um, so that's really what it's about. Uh, and it just so happened that I was writing it just as the recession hit and as we were going through a tough time. Mm -hmm. So I actually altered the introduction and included uh, a really life changing part of the recession. Um, I think it, you were alluding to it earlier. Yes. Our, yes. Can we get to that? Know, let's let's get to that about story. What happened in 2011? Yes. Yes. Tell us uh, that story. It's an amazing story. Now. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I think that again, I you know what, what's it, it was really the, the writing of the book and the timing of it. It was pretty interesting uh, that I actually all this stuff with the recession happened. Um, you know, and again, it, I think it's a good reason to be intentional about the culture we want to create, not knowing, I never realized that, that all the things I was doing, open books and all that thing was actually also an insurance program for a crisis mm -hmm. as we're you know, experiencing now in this, in the COVID times as well. Right. Um, you know, I had, I had wanted to open my, a, a third restaurant in Chicago in 2007, uh, not good timing. Um, I, I was in the Six Corners neighborhood, you know, Porter yeah, Park area. Right. Um, and I had invested in a, in a lease, in a building, started remodeling it, and the recession hit, and uh, LaSalle Bank got bought out by one of the big banks, and the big bank pulled our loan, so I had to stop, I stopped construction, and which was fine, you know, it's probably a good thing anyhow, except that it left me pretty cash, our cash reserves were down to a minimum at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so it just left me really, our, our organization kind of weak going into the recession, which was hard. Um, we were making it just fine until around 2010-ish where they started construction um, in 2010, they started this major construction uh, across the street from our Elgin restaurant to build mm -hmm. a Sam's Club and a Walmart. And in that construction, they tore up the whole intersection and widened the roads in front of the Elgin right. restaurant right. from two lanes to six lanes. And Huge and intersection. That, oh, my gosh. It, yeah, you've driven through it. It totally killed our business there. Uh, for that from April of 2011 through, uh, yeah, through the summer of 2011, which are our best, you know, months, uh, our sales were down over 50%. Um, so that was a huge, on top of already the recession, you know, the recession I thought was going to be ending. We thought, oh, awesome. This is going to be great. You know, right. build yep. more traffic. And I didn't, I knew there would be, you know, we did budget a little bit for the construction, but nothing like, you know, what happened. Um, and one thing led to another, I mean, we just couldn't, you know, the Crystal Lake restaurant was helping us get through it somewhat. But finally, by the time we got to the end of the summer, I, I had done, I had started, you know, a few months earlier, made a cash flow projection model. And I could see about four weeks out, we we're going to run out of money. Right. Um, and this was like September, uh, yeah, September. Uh, and I'm like, holy crap, we're not going to make it. The opening of that those stores is going to be in October. I was like, we're not going to make it. You know, we're, I'm done. I really thought this is it. You know, I'm going to have to shut our doors. I'm not going to be able to make payroll. And when I saw that, I'm like, you know, again, our values are open and honest communication. You know, we communicate openly, clearly, and honestly is one of our values. And I, you know, I said, well, I'm going to have to tell the team that, you know, I, we have about four weeks left of payroll and they need to either find a job or do something. Um, so with that, uh, when I started talking to the team, they're like, Nick, you know, this is, you know, thank you. And I, here I am prepared for people to quit and start, you know, right. you know, abandoning ship. And instead they're like, you know what, Nick, we think we need to share this with the community. We need to let them know. Mm. And I'm like, what? You know, I, I, I already feel like shit, you know? Sorry yeah, for yeah. language. But, no, know. no, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, here I am thinking, you know, I suck. 
you know, I should be selling steak or pasta or something like I'm, you know, I'm going through the list of all the things I invest way too much money in training. You know, I'm doing all these things wrong. And, I'm, and then the team is like, wants me to share that with our community too, right, you know? Right. Right. And, uh, and uh, you know what? They were right. And I agreed mm -hmm. with them and I have, I definitely had some resistance at first where I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, and I, you know, and again, these are servers and bartenders and, you know, 16 17 year olds are like let's let's put something together let's share with our community let's do a last hurrah for them to come in so i was like all right you know i kind of was on the fence about it and sure enough we get to the end of this one week where we had a big promotion and the promotion didn't bring in the sales that we needed that saturday morning i opened up my computer and see our numbers and i was like I honestly was in tears. I was like, this right. is it. I'm done. So I, have to, I have to write a letter to our guest. Mm -hmm. So that moment, I wrote a letter in that Saturday morning. I wrote a letter to our guest about, you know, we had a database of about, I think, 18,000 mm -hmm. people on our database of frequent diners, mm -hmm. you know, that I, we send emails to. So I, before I sent that email, I shared it with my team. And I said, could you proofread this? Take a look at it. What do you think? And I was being really honest, you know, I, I shared in that letter that, you know, I wanted that community to know that it wasn't, we we're going to go out of business and we we're going out of business. And it wasn't because of my team or my managers. It was really my fault. I had overextended us in 2007, left, left our company weak. And now we just weren't able to get through the construction and all this stuff. And it was, it was my fault. And I wanted them to know that. And I wanted to know we we're grateful for, for the their service you know them coming visiting us over the years and i you know being the optimist that i am i did finish with and you know maybe if you you want to come in and say come in and say goodbye or maybe if enough people come in and say goodbye we'll, it'll be a big enough boost that maybe we can get through this the next you know right to the opening of the big stores um so my team looks at it and says awesome this is great and I had also been talking to my bank, I share with right. my bank, let them know so they wouldn't be surprised. And of course the banker is like, are you crazy? <laughs> you can't do this. You're being way too honest. Oh, you know? uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. You know, As expected. And, yes. Yeah. They're like, you know, you're going to have the vendors are going to be cash only. They're not going to give you, you know, you're going to have mute me, yeah. you know, you won't give product, all this stuff. And, so sure enough, you know, I had to go back to the team and told them I had also a PR friend look at it and had the same response. I go back to the team and I tell them, listen, the professionals. You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Air quotes, the professionals. Yeah. 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 They're telling us uh, that we're being too honest, too transparent. We shouldn't do this. We already, we're going to have even worse of crisis on our hands if we do it. And the team is like, no, Nick, we believe this is who we are. It's part of mm -hmm. our values, open and honest transparency is, we think we should do it. So of course, what do you think I did? Right? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And I got to tell you that it's one of those, I don't know, divine moments when I, mm -hmm. you know, three o'clock in the afternoon, I had that choice to send that email to our guest and it was like slow motion yeah. when I hit that send <laughs> button. And I was like, I just let go. I really yeah. thought whatever is meant to be, you know, I looked yeah. up to the heavens and I said, yeah. you know, this is it. And, uh, and I really thought I was going to go out of business. I thought, you know, I was going to get lambasted by the media, you know, and the quite the opposite happened. I was so blown away. Yeah. And again, it's, I really believe it's because we've been so honest and transparent with our community. You know, we had done fundraisers for years that we give back to the community. The community uses, you know, the churches, the schools, the sports teams use us yeah. for raising funds. Right. You know, so all that stuff, I guess, you know, had built it was an insurance plan, yeah. Yeah. you know. And, well, and, and, and how long did it take until someone responded to the email? Because I love this part of the story. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was, you know, here I am, like, virtually in tears to send this email <laughs> out. I'm like, downtrodden, right. you know, walking through the restaurant. Oh, this is going to be horrible, yeah. you know. And, <laughs> And I get, you know, about not even 20 minutes, you know, yeah. uh, walking through uh, a guy comes in the back door and I happen to be passed, passed by him just as he walks in. He says, Nick, I'm here. I'm like, what? <laughs> and he's like, oh, I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah, I, I got your email and I was nearby. I drove up uh, and came in 
and I, he goes, I'm here to support you, you know? And I'm really thinking, I mean, it was so quick. I was like, right. I, I was thinking he was in the parking lot or something. <laughs> um, but he goes, I, you know, I got your email. I'm, I'm coming, I'm going to get a beer and a pizza and I'm here, you know? That's great. And, and that was like the beginning of what was crazy avalanche yeah. of experience. Right. The phone started ringing off the hook. Right. I had um, my special events coordinator come out from the office and she's like, Nick, are we going to be open in a week? I'm like, well, yeah, we'll make a week. You know, that's not yeah. a problem. Yeah. Um, she goes, well, I got the football coach from the local high school said that he's going to bring the whole team on oh, you know, Friday after yeah. the game and wants to know if we're going to be open. Right. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, come on. Yeah. That's awesome. You know? Yeah. And so that, that kind of stuff. And I got to tell you, Ed, what, what happened after that mm -hmm. was a reflection of, you know, what I learned was it wasn't what I loved and I loved learning was it wasn't about me. People were coming in because of the team, right. because of the bartender, because of the server that had built relationships with them. Amen to that. Um, yep. You know, the story I've shared a million times about more of the server. That's just one of many Lisa, you know, these stories. I had several, I'm, I remember uh, Amanda coming to me in, in tears with, a regular guest on a Friday night, mm -hmm. oh, mom and daughter, you know, come in every Friday, you know, saying we're here to see Amanda, you know, yeah. um, you know, this little girl bringing in with her mom and dad, you know, bringing her piggy bank of five oh. quarters, you know, how about that? Uh, yeah. yeah. They yeah. wanted to give it to me, you know, to next yeah. in our server. Yeah. So we'd be around. It was so amazing. Yeah. Well, and that, and that, my friend, is a result of uh, doing things the right way for the right reasons, which is awesome. Yeah, I mean, our our sales increase over the next five weeks, one hundred and ten percent. We got enough cash. Our local vendor, the produce guy, dropped off a week's worth of vegetables oh. that on the house. Yeah. Um, did you send the, the banker? Did you send the banker a tomato? You know what happened? That <laughs> you laugh at this. The local banker. He actually called me at five o'clock that evening, you know, yeah. and um, I guess he had, you know, someone in his, his bank had gotten the letter. Yeah. And he left me, a, obviously I didn't answer the call. He left me a voicemail. Um, we were so busy. And he said, Nick, I guess you went ahead and sent that letter that I suggested <laughs> you shouldn't send. Well, I'm glad you did because our, our, our team at the bank, you know, our employees are saying, asking me what are we going to do to help Nick's oh. um, I've getting phone calls from our board of directors asking us what are we going to do to help Nick's wow. our customers are asking us what are we going to do to help Nick's so guess what we're going to be there <laughs> we're going to not only come in and dine in but we're also going to take a look at your and restructure your debt and see oh. how we figure this out together how about uh, that like, yeah amazing. how about that yeah well that that's a phenomenal story to wrap things up I, and, and and before we go where can our, and we'll put everything in the show notes with all the links to what you're going to share with us. Where can our listeners find out more about you, what you're doing about Nick's and of course, uh, find the book. Yeah, for sure. I mean, go on Amazon and check out a slice of the pie. Um, really appreciate, you know, the, the story. Cause I do want to share this with other business owners, managers, leaders. This is definitely a, a model for the 21st century of how we lead. And, and now I teach, uh, the Trust and Track Institute is trustandtrack.com. You can reach out and uh, I'm there. You can reach out to me. But really, you know, how, for me, my, my purpose in life is to get, you know, purpose and values in organizations, get this kind of work out there in the world to mm -hmm. help have this kind of impact on our society, you know, help small, medium-sized business because that really is the fabric of America and mm -hmm. really how we're going to make a change and how we're going to get through crises like this. It truly is. That is, that's incredible. Thank you so much, Nick. I, I appreciate you taking time out. You know, I know that the schedule is crazy right now and to, to take so much time out and to share everything with us. Uh, I, I am extremely grateful for that. Thank you, Adam. I'm grateful for the opportunity and uh, to share. Uh, thank you for picking me and the opportunity to share this with uh, your audience. I wish we had more time so we could tell more stories because I have a feeling we're just getting started. <laughs> yes, yeah, there's quite a few. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Nick. All right. Take care now. Be well.